Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to Quadriga coming to you from the heart of Berlin. And this week the focus is on the dangerous standoff between Iran and the US in the Persian Gulf, where each side is accusing the other of aggression. Tension rose in July when Iran seized a British tanker. The US and the UK are both stepping up their military presence in the region, but Europe, or at least continental Europe, is refusing to get on board the US-led naval mission and is instead continuing to put its faith in the nuclear deal struck with Iran in 2015, which President Trump withdrew America from last year. So our question this week here on Quadriga is Iran crisis Europe on the sidelines? And to discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by Ali Fatola Nejad, a Middle East expert with think tanks like the Brookings Institution and the German Council on Foreign Relations. He argues that the big challenge is to transcend two equally simplistic perceptions of the Islamic Republic, Europe's tendency towards glorification and Washington's penchant for demonization. Also with us is Alan Posner, a regular commentator for the Berlin-based daily Die Welt. He believes that Europe is on the front line of Iran's aggression. If we choose appeasement, he says, we will pay dearly for our cowardice. And a very warm welcome, too, to Ulrike Herrmann, who's a business journalist with another Berlin daily, the Tageszeitung, or the Tats, as it's also known. And Ulrike argues that the oil price is not rising. The economic indicators suggest that there is no real Middle East crisis on the horizon. I'm very surprised by that. You know, there's so much, so much, in, so much evidence that the situation is tense and getting tenser, and you're acting, Ulrika, as though it's all going to blow over sometime very soon. Well, I'm not saying that the markets are always right. They might, <laughs> no, perhaps uh, they are uh, too lazy to recognise the danger. But it is interesting that in the middle of such upheaval politically, there is still so much. Uh, calm uh, when it comes to the markets and uh, well and um, so apparently uh, the traders think that there's nothing going to happen because otherwise the oil price would rise because 90 percent of all the middle east oil or the uh, the gulf region's oil is being transported uh, through the strait of hormuz mm -hmm. so apparently but, they don't but, but really what see do you say to all the germans who are talking about a sense of deja vu they're talking about the provocation the counter provocation the uh, the non-verifiable claims that are being made by each side they're, they're saying that it, it feels so much like 2000 and the Gulf War back then. Yes, probably. But, you know, the biggest mistake ever made by the U US in this region was exactly this uh, war against Iraq. And I can't imagine them repeating this very big mistake because by destroying the Iraq, they uh, somehow pushed Iran into the position that mm. it has now. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think that the uh, Americans are keen on having another war going. And... Uh, um, Last point is yeah, that the problem really is that Trump starts so many conflicts. Uh, he's got a conflict with uh, China going on. He's got a conflict with his own Fed. Uh, you know, every day there's a new conflict. So it is very hard to somehow uh, still think it's really serious. Mm -hmm. Not taking it very seriously. Ali Fatola Nejad, the International Crisis Group, has made its contribution. It's come out with a, a drastic, you'd have to say, assessment of what's going on. Let me just quote from it. It says it's all about averting the Middle East's 1914 moment and says that the situation is reminiscent of tensions on the eve of World War I. Uh, that's strong stuff. What do you make of it? Well, uh, first of all, I didn't read, read the report and usually the uh, publications of the International Crisis Group are quite solid. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if uh, this historical comparison uh, is, is correct because if we, for example, compare the situation today in the region with that of in the eve of the US invasion of Iraq, we see that geopolitically speaking, there is no comparison whatsoever because Iran is much stronger mm -hmm. in the region. And of course, the US military and a lot of actors in the region do know that. So they know that the ramifications of a large-scale war would be incalculable for all actors involved. And this is still the case, so that uh, neither the Iranian side nor the American side are really interested in a large-scale conflagration. But it doesn't mean that because of the volatility of the region we won't see any further steps of escalation. Because mm, the ICG does also say that even a small-scale incident could trigger a bigger conflict Absolutely. and there this are enough parties involved in the conflict <coughs> who might want to you know, do that actually 
actually do that trigger a conflict? Absolutely. We have a highly militarized Persian Gulf region uh, in the wake of the most recent incidents in, in, in that part of the world. And so the issue of miscommunication or the lack of communication and, you know, the density of uh, military, uh, uh, you know, material in, the, in, in that particular region is, of course, you know, posing a very uh, strong risk. And there are also hardline elements um, on all sides who might want to see, uh, you know, a, a smaller scale uh, military conflict from which they think they can benefit. Mm -hmm. Alan, you say Europe is on the front line of Iran's aggression. How so, Europe? <laughs> well, look, um, quite generally speaking, um, this, this conflict started when, uh, when the British seized an Iranian tanker uh, off Gibraltar, which was bound for Syria. Syria is, has been the object of Iranian aggression. They basically occupy the country, their own... Uh, 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 the, the country, and we've seen one result in a huge wave of refugees. So we are on the front line of Iranian aggression in that respect. Also, we are, though we in Germany are more dependent on Russia, Russian oil, than we are on oil from the Persian Gulf, we're certainly, Europe as a whole, is much more dependent on oil from that region than, for instance, the United States, which is not an oil importer, it's an oil exporter. So. We should be taught, we in Europe should be much more worried about what Iran is doing than, for instance, America needs to be. And, um, and, and we talk about this as if it were a conflict between, you know, Trump and the Ayatollahs. But in fact, Donald Trump has no interest whatsoever in, uh, you've said it, I'm not going to, you know, repeat all the reasons. He, he would be scared stiff for many good reasons to start a big war in the Gulf. It's us who should be asking ourselves what's happening and why we aren't doing anything. When you ask those questions, you use some very emotive language. If we choose appeasement, we will pay dearly for our cowardice. Why, yes. Why do you choose to use such emotive, such, uh, such burdened language? Uh, well, um, I, uh, n not because I think, you know, appeasement is a word from the 30s, not because I think that Iran is, is, is com comparable to Nazi Deutschland, let's be clear. But the fact is, they aren't heading for world domination, but they are heading, if they don't already have it, for regional domination. And again, this is our neighbourhood, it's not the neighbourhood of the United States. And if Iran controls the region, destroys Israel as they, as they have pledged to do, um, uh, create a, a Shia dominated Middle East with, with, with millions of Sunni paying the price as they are doing in Syria and so on, then we in Europe will pay the price the oil will, uh, will break down, we'll have even more refugees, we will sooner or, be, or later be forced into a military conflict somewhere, if not in the Persian Gulf, then maybe um, in Lebanon or eventually in, in Turkey, wherever, we don't know. We have to stop Iranian aggression now, and we can. Do you buy into this, you no. guys? <laughs> I think it's uh, the completely wrong attitude because you know once you have uh, um, once uh, you uh, you are threatening the Iran, all you achieve is to have the Ayatollah regime being strengthened. Because you know uh, most Iranians, after 40 years of rel religious dictatorship, would love to change the regime, but they, it's not possible. As soon as you start attacking the Ir uh, Iranian regime from outside, of course, everyone in Iran has to somehow uh, uh, to stand behind the regime because they don't want to be uh, uh, they don't want to risk to have any invasion by the U.S. or anything. So you can't have an internal upheaval, which most Iranians would love to have if you have this threat from outside. So, you know, you, all you uh, uh, achieve is just the opposite of what you want. I don't get the logic, sorry. Uh, no. I think we were talking about two different issues, about the geopolitics of the region, where you, you know, pointed in, in quite a stark terms, I have to say, to the role that Iran plays in the region. And undoubtedly, it's a, it's a negative role. But uh, part of the picture is also that the other side of the coin of those problematic actors in the region is also Saudi Arabia. Exactly. So we have not only, you know, limited to Saudi Arabia in Iran, I can also think of other problematic actors. But what is true, of course, is, is, is that 
uh, in, partic in, in the particular cases of uh, Syria, Iraq, um, and uh, partly Yemen, uh, you know, uh, and Lebanon, uh, Iran is playing a you know a problematic role. Uh, but then, in other theaters, would argue that it's Saudi Arabia that is uh, playing uh, you know the, the 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 primordial bad role, so to speak. So I think what we need is that we we have to be criti critical vis-a-vis -vis both actors in the region, and we have to understand that both Saudi Arabia and Iran are playing their part in. In, in this kind of tumultuous, you know, geopolitics of the region. Uh, the other question is, how do we devise any kind of Iran policy that is not strengthening the regime? Exactly. Where, you know, that is not producing the kind of dynamics that you have laid down. So what we've been seeing a, a decade ago is that the crippling sanctions regime, you know, imposed by the Obama administration, uh, of course, has, you know, uh, weakened civil society and strengthens those political economic actors within the regime who have privileged access to resources and then, you know, can thus externalize the cost of sanctions onto the civilian population. So we see a similar dynamic right now. On the other hand, we also see a lot of pressure um, imposed upon the state. Uh, you know, in the wake of sanctions. For example, if you look at uh, figures of Iranian oil exports, we see that despite, uh, you know, a lot of uh, claims to the contrary, the U.S. economic uh, pressure strategy has been quite successful. Um, so I think there are different facets of, you know, of, of sanctions policy, of policy in general, that we have to take into account. And we have to make sure that this is not uh, a policy that is, you know, very much uh, playing into those hands that we don't want to see them. OK, before Alan comes back in, uh, we've had our first impressions of this simmering geopolitical showdown between Donald Trump's America and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Let's just take a quick look at the recent chronology of the conflict and then we will come back to Alan Posner. <laughs> With the stroke of a pen, President Trump announced the US withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal just over a year ago. He imposed new sanctions and threatened those who trade with Iran. What followed was a steady escalation of tensions between the two countries. Iran began to enrich more uranium. Several oil tankers were attacked and the US declared Iran to be responsible. Britain impounded an Iranian oil tanker off the coast of Gibraltar. Iran retaliated by capturing a British tanker in the Strait of Hormuz. Tensions peaked when the US deployed an aircraft carrier and bombers to the Persian Gulf. Trump threatened to obliterate Iran, yet called off a planned airstrike at the last minute. War with Iran is the mother of all wars, countered Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, though he signaled a willingness to talk. Just a lot of saber rattling before they sit down at the negotiating table? Yeah, that is the question. Is it a lot of saber rattling or is there more to it? Well, the... Again, the, the chronology that your, your, your film showed is wrong because it starts as if, you know, the stroke of the pen by, by Donald Trump, was it wise, was it not wise, I don't know, it was the beginning. Iran has been, you, you said it, uh, has been attacking in the region, it, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, uh, funding Hamas, funding terror groups all over the place for, for years now. And the... The, the withdrawal from the nuclear agreement was a retaliation to aggression which started with Iran. Now, I'm not saying that Saudi Arabia, for instance, which is scared stiff of Iran, uh, is they're some kind of angels. They're a horrible regime, but they are a status quo regime. They don't want to change the, the, the delicate balance of power in that region. Iran is a revolutionary regime, still after 40 years. And, and, and this is... This, they cannot be allowed to, to completely destabilise... Well, I mean, they've already succeeded, but to go well, on destabilising okay, the region. Point, point made, but point Mr. taken. Postman, I mean, Saudi Arabia doesn't have to be a revolution regime in order to, you know, uh, rain Yemen with bombs, right? So I think in terms they of... They are reacting to the Houthi aggression well, and they are funded I'm, by Iran. Everyone well, knows no. that. But, but everyone also knows that uh, in terms of Iranian involvement in the region, Yemen is on a different category than Iran when it comes to Iran's involvement in Syria and Iraq. I mean, when it comes to Yemen, the, you know, the prime culprit is, of course, Saudi Arabia. So I wouldn't conflate those two cases. Okay, Although, okay. You, you know, the Houthis are supported by Iran without no doubt. Before you to continue your <laughs> own personal tit for tat here, uh, Ulrika, I thought the... Uh, the, the nuclear deal signed in 2015 was, uh, was a triumph of diplomacy. It was. 
<laughs> no, it wasn't. It was a triumph of stupidity. No, it was a... No, I mean... Uh, one second. It, a triumph of stupidity uh, in one sentence and then we'll let... Uh, because come the back deal here. said Iran can have a nuclear bomb in ten years. All the mullahs had to do was to wait. Now, if that's a triumph of diplomacy, then... then, then, then then the Munich Agreement was, was, was I mean, come on. The, the, promise someone you get a, the bomb in 10 years and you call it a try and... What? Well, well <laughs> the idea was to uh, prevent uh, Iran from enriching uh, the, the uh, at, uh, atomic material for the bomb, so it was very effective. And the hope was that once you... Uh, reduce the pressure on the regime that this democratic change that was to evolve would somehow uh, be possible. Now that you... Uh, that we worked had that, great, didn't it? That really worked very well, didn't it? it? it yes. Uh, it, uh, it's, then, no, they started uh, having demonstrations. There were all these women no longer wearing the scarf. But all these movements are now dead because you put on pressure uh, on the regime. So there was the possibility of having a peaceful change in Iran and everything's destroyed just by Donald Trump. Let's well, bring in Ali. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know where to start. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think, I mean, I, I mean, I, I do agree with what was said about Iran's role, but probably, you know, in terms of terminology, I would be more care careful. But um, I was also supportive of the Iran nuclear deal. I thought that the nuclear crisis between the West and Iran has to be settled uh, diplomatically. Mm. This is what happened. But after that, uh, I was also very much openly criticizing the European policy on Iran that I considered to be too soft, if you wanted to put it in simplistic okay. ways. Just one question because about what, you, you, what Europe failed to do is use the kind of economic and political leverage that it has had amassed in Tehran in order to force the Iranians, at least for some gradual course corrections, domestically but also in the region. So this is what Europe, you know, failed to do. And as a consequence, the gap between US policy on Iran and European policy on Iran, you know, wide, widened immensely. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, what, what would the language be that you would use? The, the, when we talk about the deal, has it begun to unravel? Is it unraveling or has it already unraveled? I mean, it is <laughs> definitely on the verge of collapse. And if you... Um, and what would that mean you, for you, European diplomacy in the coming months and years? It will I mean, be a disaster because this is still the cornerstone of European policy on Iran. Well, this is what, you know, official European policy says today. But, uh, you know, we have to think beyond the Iran nuclear agreement while trying to keep it. And for that to happen, the Europeans must figure out a way to provide Iran with the economic dividends that Tehran wants. But this is something that is unlikely to happen. So, you know, the, the, there is no doubt that the JCPOA is in, you know, vital crisis. But we have to move beyond, not only because of the sunset clauses of the agreement itself that are mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. to kick in in the next few years, but also because of other issues of concern that is that are not only raised by the Trump administration but I think we have we, we, we do need a comprehensive approach in viewing this region not only to look at Iran but also to 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 look at the structural problems the lack of a regional security architecture that is working mm -hmm. and we need really a more comprehensive understanding what is driving geopolitics in that region and for that we have to look also what is happening inside of those countries the socioeconomic situation the political situation the ecological situation so all those crises also driving uh, what we consider as to be geopolitics mm -hmm. Uh, let's just rewind a little bit. As far as the US request for other nations to join in its naval mission in the Gulf, Berlin responded what, with what was widely described here as a blunt no. Here's the German foreign minister with his statement. Together with the French and the Britons, we discussed at length what such a mission could look like. Also, an alternative to the US strategy of maximum pressure on Iran, which we believe is wrong. At the moment, the Britons would rather join an American mission. We won't do that. What do you make of that statement, Alan? It went down very well in Germany. I think most people said, yes, it's the right thing to do because Donald Trump is trigger-happy. Well, we've heard that Donald Trump isn't trigger-happy. There's not going to be a war. So, but but what, if you encourage the Iranians, they might become more trigger-happy. This is simply a document of cowardice and defeat. We're waving the white flag. We're saying to the Iranians, go on, nab another couple of tankers. We are going to be an observer mission. Oh, 
big deal. We know who's attacking the tanker. We don't have to observe everything, anything anymore. The British, I mean, we're always talking about how we want to create a security architecture in Europe, which includes the British, even if they leave the Euro European Union. And the first thing we do is when their tankers are attacked, is to say, OK, you go along with Trump. He's going to, you know, you're going to do the protection. We're going to observe. Uh, what are we going to do when they attack our tankers? What are we going to do if somewhere else our tankers are attacked? And then we go running to the British who happen to have a navy, as we Not don't. Not much of a one in this instance, in terms of the, the, the vessels they can actually send to the region. Not much more well, than Germany. Well, well, exactly. But when we, when, we, when we actually need help, now this is, they're going to say, well, what did you do when, ours, uh, 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 when we were attacked? Mm. I mean, this is simply a breakdown of, of, of solidarity and, and the fact. I mean, what is the transatlantic partnership there for? If, if you don't happen not to like the president, you prefer to capitulate for a couple of turban-wearing ayatollahs. Come on. I mean, here's a, the, a democratic nation like the United States, and there's a theocratic dictatorship. The choice is easy, mm. not to Germans, but, you know. Ulrike? Well, I think uh, I'd like to introduce another topic because I mean, I no, no, because the main, no, an economic topic because the main problem is that the Europeans don't have any leverage because they are bound to the dollar as the reserve currency. When you look at why do the US sanctions work so well, it's because the dollar is needed by everyone trading globally. So if the Europeans really wanted to have some leverage at all against someone like Trump, because I think that Trump really is a very a global problem, then what they needed was the, to have the euro as a u reserve currency. And as long as the euro is weak because of the euro crisis, there will be no European um, uh, policy that can uh, counteract against uh, Trump. So you can just forget about the Europeans as long as there's a euro crisis. As somebody who moves between Doha <laughs> and Berlin, what's your take on all this, on the, 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 well, the leverage that the Europeans have, the role that the Europeans have, the divisions within Europe now, with the UK on the one hand and the continental Europeans on the other and Brexit looming? Well, um, I think that uh, what we've been seeing over the past few uh, weeks and months is that... Um, not only have there been signs from the Trump administration side that they're openly, you know, willing to talk to the Iranian side, but also vice versa. We have been, you know, we have seen signals of, uh, or the Iranian Iranians basically testing the waters uh, in terms of how far they can go in terms of negotiating yeah. and and what to negotiate about. But what is still is uh, what is still lacking is the green light from the supreme leader of Iran, who is, you know, th that is indispensable in terms of any kind of, uh, you know, decisions and negotiations. And uh, in this picture, obviously, the main uh, decision will be made in uh, Washington and in Tehran and not in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe, of course, can play a mediating role, and France has tried to do that. Um, and it can be fruitful because well, Europe Germany, has very Germany's good... Germany's gone quiet. <laughs> Sir? What about Germany? Germany is, is on holiday. <laughs> no, I mean, basically, so what the European policy is right now is that the, the French uh, are doing, uh, so are, are, you know, are, are acting on behalf of uh, the, the core European states. And, um, and, and the French are, you know, quite also sharing the kind of concerns of the US administration in terms of Iran's regional policies much more than uh, the German government, actually. So, beca so because of that, actually, France could, you know, play a hopeful uh, role. But then again, it's not up to Europe. Alan, your newspaper has been criti crit criticising Frau Merkel for being inactive in, uh, in forging a proper alliance with the E3, the, 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 the Brits, the French and the Germans. Well, uh, and, uh, and my paper's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, we have this crisis, everyone's talking about war. We, we don't believe there's going to be a war, but the people are worried and the Chancellor is, is, is silent. Uh, reading a book about Shakespeare in her summer holidays. Um, interesting, by the way, a book on the tyrant, how to deal with the tyrant. And the point is, Shakespeare you proves read, the only way to deal tweets. with the tyrant is to topple him. Um, be it Macbeth, be it Richard II, be it uh, the supreme leader uh, of Iran. This guy is a danger to the world. Well, you know, but I can just repeat myself. It, it, it was just the same kind of analysis that led uh, 2003 to the toppling of uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and it was really a major mistake. And I, I think that you should not uh, somehow always think that whenever you feel disturbed by someone else uh, around the globe that you should start a war.
No one's oh, talking okay. about <laughs> starting a war or feeling disturbed by someone. Uh, by someone. And what I'm saying is we have a... Uh, Iran is aiming for regional hegemony and for regional destabilization, and that will destabilize Europe. It's already started. But, but this is what I'm, I mean, we don't have to be myopic. I mean, Iran is, uh, is not a stabilizing force in the region, but nor is, you know, Saudi Arabia, nor is sometimes Israel. So we have, nor is sometimes uh, Turkey, for that matter. So we have to take a comprehensive approach in order to be able to solve the, this perennial crisis that we have in the region. If we keep on, you know, having, I mean, if uh, the choice will be between a military regime change policy a la neoconservatism in Iraq or authoritarian stability policy that Europe w likes to do with all kinds of dictatorships in the region, th those are two bad choices. So we have to Agreed. figure out something, you know, Agreed. beyond that. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. That is where we're going we're to have to leave you there. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'd love to have more time. Great discussion. We've been talking about the Iran crisis, Europe on the sidelines. It looks a little bit that way. Thanks for joining us. Come back next week. Week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.